Hello, hello, hello. Hope everyone's having a wonderful Sunday evening. And um, we started on New Year's Eve. We're in Chapter 5 now. Chapter 5. This is going to be broken down into three parts. Uh, I have everything where I'm going to stop and everything. So, Chapter 5 will be three parts. We are going to get this rolling because I'm trying to get this done because with the next book, I want you to actually see that while we're, uh, while we're, while something's going on. So, before we get into the book or chapter five, let's start this like we start everything else. People are always asking me. Why am I so angry? The reason is because the country that I love destroying itself from within. That's why I am. The angry conservative. Hello, hello, hello. And welcome back. It's been, other than New Year's Eve, it's been a while since we've gotten into this book. But we are going to get into this. We will start Chapter 5 tonight. So, I do have everything pulled up. I have everything ready to go. So, here we go, people. In the future, you will own nothing. When the masterminds at the World Economic Forum write or talk about the forthcoming Industrial Revolution, they often detail forthcoming technological advance, advancements and elaborate on the disruptive effects that tech will likely cause for future generations and society. Huh. I wonder why that is. I wonder why that is. They also use open-ended predictions about the future to advocate for concepts and programs discussed in the first few chapters of this book. And uh, you've seen all that. If you've been with me for a while, you've seen everything that they have tried to do. But rarely do Schwab and others at the WEF paint a comprehensive picture of what society will look like for everyday Americans in the wake of these far-reaching innovations. 
So when the World Economic Forum website published an article titled Welcome to 2030, I own nothing, have no privacy, and life has never been better. It caught my attention along with millions of other people. (laughs) And as you can tell, the numbers, everything's in the description, so you know what's coming. Ida Akin is the author of the new infamous article, which was originally posted to the WES website in 2016, but did not gain significant attention until 2020, following the launch of the WEF's great do-over campaign. Akin is a Danish politician and was a member of the WES Young Global Leaders Program at the time she wrote the piece. In the article, Atkinson depicts a future where the idea of property rights is flipped on its head. Hmm. Property rights. Writing from the perspective of a fictional citizen in the year 2030, Akin describes a world devolved uh, devo- the void of private ownership of homes, cars, and most other goods. In other words, people chose to do things differently. It might seem odd to you, Akin writes, but it makes perfect sense for us in this city. Everything you consider a product has now become a service. Instead of owning a home, people rent. Instead of owning a car, people use public transportation. Instead of purchasing appliances and other goods, they borrow products for a limited duration. This idea of renting or borrowing everything even extends to the clothes people wear. Doesn't sound doesn't that sound lovely? Doesn't that sound lovely? Shopping, Atkinson says, I can't really remember what that is. For most of us, it has been turned into choosing things to use. You see, since you will not actually own anything in the future, you will not, you are not really shopping. Not owning much, if anything, might seem off-putting to most modern Americans, but it is a necessary concession to live in Atkinson's 2030 utopia. In 2030, according to her article, much of the labor and work will be done by robots and artificial intelligence, but instead of sitting in traffic to compute to a 9-to-5 job, People are free to enjoy life and sleep well and spend time with friends and family. Hmm. All right. This sounds good. This sounds this sounds really, really good. But there's more, believe me. These new ways of doing things are so good in 2030, it has made life much more efficient and enjoyable. When you are not using an appliance, it is available to borrow for someone else who uses it. When you are traveling and not using your living room, it can be repurposed so it can be used for business meetings. Wait a minute. I thought in this utopian world, most people aren't working. I guess that means your living room is less likely to be repurposed for a business meeting or more likely to host bi-weekly jam sessions for Dave's band or maybe Debbie's goat yoga class. According to Atkinson and her imagined 2030 society, people have shifted away from the same model of growth that dictates much of our modern public policy debate. By doing things differently, the people of Atkinson's future world have eliminated lifestyle diseases, climate change, the refugee crisis, 
environment degraded degradation completely congested cities water pollution air pollution social unrest and unemployment sounds great right we can eliminate all these terrible things and all we have to do is give up private property ownership what a deal i'm sure there are plenty of people who were clamor to sign up to live in Atkinson's fantastical, fantastical world, most of whom would be found at Democratic Socialists of America meeting. When Atkinson's article started to receive significant attention in 2020, many conservatives and limited government advocates were shocked and alarmed a development that seemed to bewilder many of the leaders at the World Economic Forum. After all, nowhere in this piece does the author suggest government should be in control of anything. If this, if this future is simply the result of private actors making voluntary interactions, shouldn't those who support limited government accept Atkinson's outlook for humanity? There are some conservatives and libertarians who say yes. I will explain why they are dead wrong later. (laughs) Oh, and I love how he does it, too. Making matters more complicated, many media pundits on the right mistakenly read Atkinson's WEF article as if it were an official policy proposal offered by the World Economic Forum. This problem became so widespread that the author had to add a special note to the article explaining that it was not intended to be a policy framework, but rather a scenario showing where we could be heading for better and for worse. Atkinson further explained that she wrote this piece to start a discussion about some of the pros and cons of current technological development. I don't truly buy Atkinson's description of her goals, but I agree that many at the WEF believe the age of disruption ahead is mostly inevitable and that all leaders in business and government can do it today is to work to shape the future in a way that fits with the values espoused by elites. Exactly. Regardless of the intention of the author and the article's publisher, when Atkinson's piece started to get the traction it rightly deserves, it scared the heck out of tens of millions of people around the world, myself included. And once you couple this potential future with concept of the great do-over and the great narrative, it will all really scare the heck out of you. If most people lose the ability to own property for whatever reason, life will not be like the utopia Atkinson describes. Instead, most citizens will effectively have no economic or social power, very few freedom, and no ability to give their children a better life than the one they had enjoyed. People may have access to cheap stuff and services, but there will still be a price, and a steep one at that, the end of liberty. There's reasons why I'm doing this book, people. Believe me. The future will not be on VHS. To most, the idea of not owning anything probably seems like Far off concept, especially when you think about it through the lens of the capitalistic, consumer centric culture that we live in now. How could we possibly shift towards a society like the one described in Atkinson's Your Own Nothing article? The answer is gradually. And I say this with confidence because we can already see this trend playing out in a number of industries today. We can see it actually happening in big cities. Just saying. 
For example, one aspect of our economy where the idea of owning nothing has developed the fastest is the entertainment industry. Technological innovation has dramatically altered the way we access movies, television, short films, podcasts, music, and other forms of entertainment. Prior to the mid-1970s, if you wanted to see a movie, you would either watch whatever was on television or head to the local movie theater. It was not until the advent of Betamax and VHS that the general public had the ability to buy their favorite movies and watch them whenever they wanted at home. This development caused the home entertainment industry to boom as more people purchased technology to watch movies in the comfort of their own living rooms. Prices fell, home entertainment, technology advanced, and movie studios focused more attention on selling already released movies to consumers on videotape cassettes. Videotape soon gave way to DVDs, and by 2005, DVD sales gradually generated more than $15 billion in revenue per year. Dang! That! 15 billion people with new releases selling for $20 and dollar bins popping up at blockbuster video stores everywhere. Private movie collections grew. Arthur's note for readers under the age of 30, blockbuster was a chain, <laughs> was a chain of movie rental stores where people spent, spent hours looking for a movie to watch based solely on its cover picture printed on a small box representing the movie. Families would take these movies home, and if they failed to rewind VHS tapes before returning the films, Blockbuster would find you. If you made the grave error of losing one of Blockbuster's videotapes, they would take possession of your car or force you to enter and dentured servitude, whichever the company thought would be more profitable. <laughs> oh, that is funny. But then something unexpected happened. At the height of Blockbuster's empire, physical media sales and rentals started to fall. By 2018, DVD sales had dropped a whopping 86% from their height in 2005. Blu-ray, once billed as the next generation of home video, peaked in 2013 before rapidly falling in the years that followed, which caused the incredible drop. Were people suddenly disinterested in movies and home entertainment? Of course not. Innovation happened. Streaming services such as Netflix Blitz and Hulu changed the entertainment industry forever. Advancements in internet speeds and tech devices created an environment in which consumers could buy access to a streaming service and watch as many movies as they wanted, including films made a half century earlier as opposed to buying a DVD from a brick and mortar store. By 2020, streaming services represented more than 70% of all home video revenue, and with companies such as Disney and HBO investing increasingly more money in their streaming services, this trend is sure to continue in the years ahead. Hmm. Streaming services, people. I wonder if they realized that this is very much part of the plan. Streaming services offer a deal that's too good to pass up. Instead of paying 65 to buy a DVD box set of the newest season of your favorite TV show, you could use that $65 to buy access to a streaming services for eight months, watch every season of your favorite show, and have access to thousands of other shows and movies, too. Just like how video killed the radio star, consumer preference and technological innovation killed physical media. That's a good thing, right? Nope. 
I'll admit that I don't think there was a problem with any of this when the trend started. I love streaming services as much as the next guy. But the institutions have become more political and closely tied to government over the past several years. Serious problems with the model have been increasingly more apparent. And the biggest problem of them all is that when you no longer own media in a physical format, the version available to you through the streaming service can be altered over time to promote a specific agenda or even eliminate altogether. Occasionally, I will head over to a mostly forgotten shelf in my home where I have a collection of old DVDs and, yes, very even a few VHS tapes and pull pull out a classic movie to watch, like Top Gun. What can I say? Sometimes I feel the need, the need for speed. And when I pop that disc into the DVD, I rest assured that Maverick and Iceman's Iceman's Adventure will play out on my television set exactly as it did when I first, when I watched it for the first time in 1987. And when I watched the DVD for the 1,000th time 20 years from now, it will still be exactly the way I remember it from the 1980s. While this might seem like a relatively unimportant feature of physical media, it is actually becoming an important luxury. Because I'm going to say this now. Some of the things that I've shown you on here. I have everything backed up. And all the videos, everything I have is put on different platforms. They can change these because they're on the internet. The data printed on a disc or record onto a cassette or recorded onto a cassette are there permanently. If the physical media remains undamaged, I will have access to that data forever. But this is not the case when dealing with streaming services. The data for the movie as it exists on a streaming service service server like those owned by Netflix are fluid. At any time Netflix could take down Top Gun, its copyright owners could alter the movie and then Netflix could re-upload it without any warning to the consumer at the at home. They can do this because you don't own the content. They own it. You are merely renting access to the film. <laughs> oh, Over the past decade, numerous companies with streaming services have been caught or openly bragged about using their their power to change content based on public pressure and to promote social justice. In June 2020, in the midst of widespread Black Lives Matter protests, a number of streaming services began to reevaluate some of the content available in their libraries. HBO removed the movie 1939 Oscar-winning movie Gone with the Wind after the screenwriter John Ridley wrote an op-ed for the Los Angeles Times saying the movie glorifies the antebellum South and perpetuates some of the most painful stereotypes of people of color. HBO has since restored the film to its streaming service, but the movie is now preceded by a four-minute lecture highlighting the controversial aspects of the film and the racist practices of Hollywood at the time of the film's production. Watching Gone with the Wind can be uncomfortable, even painful, warns the Turner Classic Movie representative. I don't know about you, but nothing gets me in the mood to watch a movie like a stern lecture from my cultural betters. 
Further, in June 2020, a number of streaming services purged any de- depiction of blackface from their content libraries. And no, I'm not talking about the 19th century play streaming on vaudeville. I'm talking about episodes of shows many readers of this book would regularly watch, such as NBC's 30 Rock and Community FX, It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, ABC's Scrubs, even Golden Girls had an episode purged. In most of the cases mentioned above, the show is completely self-aware of the offensive nature of this practice and it's part of the com- comedic scene that mocks it. In one instance in the show The Office, for example, a scene was removed in which Dwight, one of the show's main characters, has a friend who sports blackface in the episode. It is made very clear that this is a generally unacceptable practice. The white's ignorance of social norms is the joke. But the nuance doesn't matter to elites running the entertainment industry. Now, these episodes are forever unavailable on streaming services. In October 2020, Disney announced it was going to add disclaimers to the beginning of a number of its movies warning viewers about native negative depictions and the mistreatment of people or cultures. These warnings have been added to classic movies such as Peter Pan, Dumbo, The Aristocrats, and Aladdin. The music and podcast streaming service Spotify has also moderated content due to social pressure. Podcasting giant Joe Rogan had more than 100 episodes removed from by Spotify because of elite alleged instances of misinformation which included dangerous things like interviewing Dr. Robert Malone, a scientist who helped to develop mRNA vaccines. <laughs> oh, yes. Gotta love that. Gotta love that. And don't expect the censors to stop there. Censorship campaigns have be, become increasingly more common in recent years even when it comes to completely uncontroversial media. For example, after the 2020 election, a movement captured headlines to have Donald Trump removed from Home Alone 2. The campaign got so much attention that even Home Alone Alone actor Macaulay Culkin responded to it in a tweet. Trump's appearance didn't involve controversial political commentary, but his mere presence in the movie was enough to outrage censorship mobs seeking to purify classic films. (laughs) Gotta love these people. And if you are a part of the censorship regime, they'll come after you if you do something wrong. The purity standards they have are very much they'll eat their own and we've been seeing it happen here lately the point of all of this is to say when you don't own physical media the media is susceptible to change the corporations that do own the media can do whatever they want with it if a show contains a joke that is considered too cruel or tasteless by current societal norms, delete it. If a movie's depiction of a person, gender, orientation, or race is no longer socially acceptable, change it. If you hold a movie, show, or even a piece of music near and dear to your heart, you might want to consider owning a physical copy because nothing is stopping it Nothing is stopping the corporation that owns it from altering or destroying it completely if the 
strong political or ideological wind to destroy media. ESG and other social credit systems might make the decisions for these companies easy. Do you think media companies are going to take your personal preferences into account if it means suffering with a reduced ESG score? If you do, you should probably reread chapter one. Now, you might think, be thinking, Glenn, why are you spending so much time talking about movies and streaming services? I picked up this book to, re to read about the future and the World Economic Forum. What does this have to do with property rights and private ownership? Well, just think about the control these corporations have over your media when you don't own it. And then imagine what they could do in a world where you don't own anything. And they, corporations and government, own everything. When they, when they own your home. Hmm. For the entire history of the United States, home ownership has been recognized property provides people with financial security as well as with a sense of responsibility over land and the surrounding community. However, after decades of home ownership beginning being an essential part of life in America, a trend has developed that transforming the United States into a nation of renters. If this continues, the development will not only have a substantial impact on working families' ability to build wealth, but it could also have dire consequences for individual liberty. Owning your own home comes with a plethora of financial benefits. As you pay down your mortgage or as, you, as your home appreciates in value, homeowners build equity. Tax laws have been written to ease, ease the burden on homeowners historically property Historically, property has proven itself to be an asset that effectively weathers financial storms and bouts of inflation. <laughs> Studies show growth in wealth yielded from home ownership overshadows every other form of wealth generation. Owning a home has proven itself to be much, be such an important con component uh, to personal wealth generation that generation that numerous presidential administrations have campaigned on increasing home ownership. In fact, both the Clinton and George W. Bush administration pursued policies designate, designed specifically to encourage home ownership. Of course, as with most things the government tries, these policies resulted in disastrous housing market meltdown, but that is a topic for a different book. Taking all of this into account, it should be no surprise that home ownership rates have for decades remained constantly high in the United States. According to stats compiled by the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis, home ownership has hovered above 60% since at least the mid-1960s. The rate peaked in 2005 when home ownership crept above 69%. By the end of 2022, the rate has slipped to just up under 66%, but still well within the average historical range. But unfortunately for Americans who yearn to join the home ownership club, there are major headwinds that develop in recent years 
that have the potential to drive this rate much lower than than we have seen in the modern era. And with that, we are done for today. So, with that being said, that is part one of chapter five. Tomorrow, I mean, next week, my bad, we will do do part two of this. I hope everyone has a wonderful evening. And remember, be good to one another because we are in this together, no matter if you're left, right, or center. I will see you guys on the next one. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light What so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming Whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight o'er the ramparts we watch were so gallantly streaming.